my shoes and out the door. Five, I'm alive. Six, seven, eight, feeling Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. I'm your co-host today, Dr. Mike Akinfora, and today I have with me Dr. Marshall Goldsmith. Marshall, how are you? Life is good. Good to talk to you. Wonderful. I'm going to read Marsh, uh, cut. I'm going to read Dr. Goldsmith's bio, and after that, we've got some questions. Dr. Marshall Goldsmith is the million-selling author or editor of 31 books, including the New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestsellers Mojo and What Got You Here Won't Get You There, a Wall Street Journal number one business book and winner of the Harold Longman Award for Business Book of the Year. His books have been translated into 28 languages and become bestsellers in eight countries. Dr. Goldsmith has recently been recognized as one of the 15 most influential business thinkers in the world in global biannual study sponsored by the London Times and Forbes. His other professional acknowledgments include Institute for Management Studies, Lifetime Achievement Award, only one of two ever awarded, American Management Association, 50 great thinkers and leaders who have used the field of management over the last 80 years, Business Week, 50 Great Leaders in America, Wall Street Journal, Top 10 Executive Educators, Forbes, Five Most Respected Executive Coaches, Leadership Excellence, Top 5 Thinkers on Leadership, Economic Tables, India, Top CEO Coaches of America, Economists in the UK, Most Credible Executive Advisors in the New Era of Business, National Academy of Human Resources, Fellow of the Academy, America's Top HR Award, World HRD Congress 2011 Global Leader in HR Thinking, 2011 Tata Award in India for Global HR Excellence, Fast Company, America's preeminent executive coach and leader to leader institute, 2010 leader of the Future Award. His work has been recognized by almost every professional organization in his field. Dr. Goldsmith's PhD is from the UCLA Anderson School of Management, where in 2010, he was recognized as one of 100 distinguished graduates in the 75-year history of the school. He teaches executive education at Dartmouth Tuck School and frequently speaks at leading business schools. He is one of a selected few executive advisors who have been asked to work with over 120 CEOs and their management team. He served on the board of the Peter Drucker Foundation for 10 years. He has been a volunteer teacher for the U.S. Army Generals, Navy Admirals, and Girl Scouts Executive, International, and American Red Cross leaders, where he was a National Volunteer of the Year. Marshall's other books include Succession, Are You Ready?, a Wall Street Journal bestseller, The Leader of the Future, a Business Week bestseller, The AMA Handbook of Leadership, The Organization of the Future 2, and The Leadership Investment, American Library. Association. All are choice award winners for Academic Business Books of the Year. Marshall, welcome to the show. Very nice to talk to you. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, it is it is my pleasure. I loved your new book, Triggers, and that's what we want to talk about today with our audience. But first, could you tell people about your journey? How did you get here? How did how did this all transpire? Well, you know, when, as a young man, I was a graduate of UCLA in organizational behavior. I was studying to be a college professor. I met a very famous man named Dr. Paul Hersey, who was kind enough to be my mentor. He let me follow him around to try to learn what he did. And then one day he became double booked. He said, can you do what I do? I said, I don't know. He said, I'll pay you a thousand dollars for one day. I was making fifteen thousand dollars for one year. I said, you know what? I'll give it a shot. Well, I ended up doing a program for the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. I was incredibly successful. They said, send Marshall back. And that's how I got into the executive education business. And that was 39 years ago. So I've been doing this now for 39 years. I've been to 97 countries. And on American Airlines alone, I have over 11 million frequent flyer miles. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> that is amazing. Yes. So let's talk about your new book, Triggers. Uh, I, it was a fascinating read for me. And I liked it so much, as I do when I find something that really tickles my fancy. I, I have, feel the need to share it. I shared it with my wife first, and she liked it so much, she read it twice. So could you talk about Triggers? Well, you know, the reason I wrote Triggers is my first big seller was called What Got You Here Won't Get You There. That was about interpersonal relationships. 
My second big seller was called Mojo. That was intrapersonal, how you look at yourself from the inside. Triggers is really about the inter interplay between the me inside of myself and the environment, the outside world around me, and how I change the world around me and how the world around me is changing me at the same time. And, you know, so few of us become the person that we want to become. Well, why? As we journey through life, we're bombarded by triggers. A trigger is any stimulus that may impact my behavior. And sometimes these push us toward becoming the person we want to become. In most cases, they push us away from becoming this person. So this book is about the environment, how to deal with triggers, why we don't do what we know we should do, and then how help, structure, direction can push us toward becoming the person that we know we want to become. I love that message. That is brilliant. How about identifying some harmful triggers for us? Well, I think it's very important as if you look at your life, as you go through a day, start measuring when I get off course. Okay. For example, uh, I give an example of the book of my wife and I, we went out to dinner one night with this couple and, and we noticed that they always made disparaging comments about people, little sarcastic jokes all the time and cynicism. And by the end of the night, we noticed we started doing the same thing. And, you know, we talked to each other and said, why do we do that? I mean, I, we wouldn't be happy if other people spent their dinner talking about which idiots we are. So why are we doing this to anybody else? And then we realized just our people, they triggered this in us. When you're around someone who speaks quietly, you tend to speak more, more quietly. Well, we decided that's not who I want to be. And again, it's not our place to judge them, but we decided that they triggered this kind of negative, sarcastic behavior and they weren't helping us become the people we wanted to be. So we're better off not sort of dealing with them so much. As you go through the day, you learn which triggers sort of push you in the right or wrong direction. Then you've got some choices. First, learn to anticipate the triggers. If possible, avoid negative triggers. For example, if you want to quit drinking, don't hang around in bars. And then the third thing is, if you cannot avoid, then you learn to adjust. Adjust your behavior so that the trigger is not controlling your life. Mm, I like that. So anticipate, avoid, and adjust. Yes. Wonderful. So how can we take back our ability to make smart decisions and become our best self? Well, one thing I teach is something called the daily question process. It's an incredibly useful process. It takes three minutes a day. All your listeners, it's going to help you get better at almost anything. It costs nothing. People are a little skeptical right now. They think at three minutes a day, help, help me get better at anything, cause nothing. It sounds too good to be true. Uh, half the people that start doing this quit within two weeks. And they do not quit because it does not work. They quit because it does work. This is incredibly easy to understand and incredibly hard to do. I've been doing this for years. And it's tough. Well, here's how it works. You, you get out an Excel spreadsheet. On one column, write down a, a list of behaviors that represent what's most important in your life. Friends, family, direct reports, coworkers, uh, health. Whatever it is for you, you write down those important behaviors that are aligned with your values. And then you have a series of questions. Every question has to be answered with yes, no, or a number. Well, every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you fill out that little spreadsheet. At the end of the week, you get a report card. I'm going to warn your listeners in advance that report card you get at the end of the week might not be quite as beautiful as a corporate values plaque you got stuck up on the wall. When you do this every day, you quickly learn life is incredibly easy to talk. Life is just difficult to live. Mm -hmm. And this is not about our talk values. It's about those live values. Mm -hmm. Those are a lot harder. I pay a woman named Kate to call me on the phone every day. I just talked to her an hour ago. I talked to her today. I talked to her tomorrow. I talked to her yesterday. I talked to her almost every day. Every day she listens to me read questions I wrote and provide answers I wrote every day. Someone asked me, why do you pay some woman to do this every day? Don't you know the theory about how to change behavior? I wrote the theory about how to change behavior. <laughs> That's why I pay a woman to call me every day. I know how hard this is. Well, it's tough. And the reason I do it is my name is Marshall Goldsmith. I'm the world's uh, last year number one ranked business thinker, and a leadership thinker, and number one executive coach. I pay a woman named Kate to call me on the phone every day just to listen to me read questions I wrote and provide answers I wrote. Why do I do this? Oh, my name is Marshall Goldsmith. I'm too cowardly to do this by myself. I'm too undisciplined. I need help. And it's okay. Well, my deepest learning over the last years is we all need help. 
and we get over this macho egotistical, I can do it on my own stuff, life gets a lot better for everybody. One thing I'm very proud of in my book, Triggers, 27 major CEOs endorsed the book. Why am I so proud? 30 years ago, no CEO would admit they have an executive coach. They'd be ashamed to have a coach. They'd be embarrassed. Well, today, these 27 real big, important people, including the CEO of the year in the United States, number three ranked leader in the world, winner of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, CEO of Pfizer and Target and Best Buy and President of the World Bank, they all step up and say, you know what? I need help and it's okay. I think that's a big leap forward for life. I, I love that. And just to add that point, I mean, you pay Kate because it keeps you essentially accountable. Exactly. And if I, I, I mean this in, in the nicest way, but if you weren't paying Kate, I don't think you would, you, you would, but most people wouldn't take it as serious. No, I wouldn't. Wrong. <laughs> don't give me that much credit. I, I, I do not place myself above anybody I talk about. Okay. I am just as cowardly and just as undisciplined as the next person. And if I don't have somebody give me structure and direction, it probably won't happen. Let me give you a couple of examples. Sure. Twyla Tharp is the world's greatest choreographer. She's a dancer. She's 75. She still looks fantastic. She's had the same personal trainer for 27 years. Now, why she had this trainer for 27 years, the trainer's not going to teach her anything new. You know, my name is Twyla Tharp. I need help, and it's okay. I don't have the courage to do this on my own or the discipline. I have to pay a trainer to day after day remind me to do the same stuff I know I'm supposed to do. Well, that doesn't mean she's stupid. That means she's smart. Mm -hmm. That's why she looks so good. Why? She knows she doesn't have the discipline to do this by herself, and she doesn't have the uh, the courage to do it by herself. She needs help. It's okay. By the way, how many of the top 10 tennis players have coaches? 10. Mm -hmm. Well, they're great tennis players. They're smart enough to know they need help. Absolutely. It's it's like that saying, uh, the smartest guy in the room is the one who knows he's not the smartest guy in the room. You, exactly. You, you absolutely, everybody needs a coach. Yeah, we all need help. And for, for myself, I've been coaching with the same uh, coaching um, cut. I've been coaching with the same coach for the last 12 years, and I'm also part of an accountability group that meets once a week, and it's worked wonders for me. So I would I'm tell not... people, align themselves with people of like mind. Exactly. And, you know, don't be ashamed. No. That was one of the things that, that you said, which I think is really important. In So Kate calls you every day. Yes. And I, I want to get into these questions, but I don't want to get into them just yet. So one of the things that Kate does, she doesn't judge you on whether or not you were able to accomplish what you were looking to accomplish. She just takes note. Correct. That's it. I that's love that. I love that. That yeah. that's brilliant because we as human beings love to judge. Oh, yeah. So by her not judging, it allows you to be arrive at your best self and you know uh, it's good because it keeps everything in your head yes see the problem with people that i coach is not bad intention uh, let me give you an example i'm probably the only teacher you've ever met who's collected feedback from tens of thousands of people who've been to my courses and i measure do they do what i teach and do they get better well, the good news is people that do the stuff get better. And I guess the better news, people do nothing, don't get worse. They just stay the same. So Johnson & Johnson was my biggest client years ago. I had the privilege of working with their top 2,000 leaders, all the way from Ralph Larson, the CEO, down to number 2,000. After my class, they were going to ask, are you, they were asked, are you going to do what Marshall just taught you to do? 98% said yes. A year later, 70% had done something and 30% zero, not one minute. I'm not ashamed of these numbers. I'm proud of these numbers. 70% of 2,000 people is 1,400 people getting evaluated by 10 coworkers each. 14,000 people have a little better life. I'm certainly not ashamed of that. Well, I got to talk to people that did nothing. I said, why'd you do nothing? The answer had nothing to do with ethics, values, or integrity. They won an award that year, most ethical company in the world. They're good people. I'm sure your listeners are good people. Nothing to do with intelligence. They're smart. I'm sure your listeners are smart. The reason people did nothing had to do with a dream. Dream I've had for years sounds like this. You know, I'm incredibly busy right now. <laughs> Given pressures of work and home and new technology that follows me everywhere and emails and voicemails and global competition, I feel about as busy as I ever have. 
sometimes I feel overcommitted. I don't tell others this, but every now and again, my life's a little bit out of control. But you know, I'm working on some very unique and special challenges right now. And I think the worst of this is gonna be over in about four or five months. And then I'm gonna take two or three weeks and get organized and spend some time with the family. And I'm gonna begin my new healthy life program. And after that, everything's gonna be different and it won't be crazy anymore. <laughs> Now, Michael, have you ever had a dream that vaguely resembles that dream? Yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've all had that dream, and there's not going to be any two or three weeks. You know, tomorrow's probably going to be even crazier than today. If we want to do something, you really need to ask yourself, what am I willing to do now? And just focus on that. What am I willing to do now? Would Would you say that these are... the what you're talking about, those examples, are the stay-in-place instincts that you talk about? Yeah, it's it's very hard, especially in many ways, the more successful we become, the harder it is to change. Mm -hmm. Any human or animal will replicate behavior that's followed by positive reinforcement. The higher up we go in life, the more positive reinforcement we get, two things happen. You know, they laugh at our jokes, they pretend we're smart. So after a while, we feel better and better about ourselves. Well, nothing wrong with that. Here's the problem. We all accept feedback from others that's consistent with the way we see ourselves. We all reject or deny feedback that's inconsistent. The more successful we become, the more positive feedback we tend to get. And the harder it is to hear negative news. The other thing is, the more successful we become, the more powerful we get. And the harder it is for anybody to tell us the truth. So given it's harder to hear the truth and harder for people to give us the truth, you can see in my job as an executive coach, why it's hard. These people have gotten nothing but positive reinforcement for being who they are over and over again. And they're all successful because they do many things right. And like all humans, they're successful in spite of doing some things that are stupid. And I've never met anybody so wonderful that we don't have something on that in spite of the list. It's amazing. We see this in professional sports all the time where the young hotshot rookie who has basically, like you said, has a certain skill set and brought those skills with them all the way through high school and college. And then they get to the major leagues and they fall on their face. Oh yeah. And That's they, right. they then have an opportunity to listen to what their coaches are saying and say, okay, you've got to shorten your swing. Your stride's got to be a little less. And the people that do that go on to become extremely successful. And the ones that don't, don't. And the ones that don't, don't. Right. So, what what would you say, what is the best thing to do to conquer our stay-in-place instincts? Well, you know, one thing that I recommend in my daily question process, I learned this from my daughter, Kelly. My daughter, Kelly, is a professor at the Kellogg School, Northwestern marketing professor, and she taught me the value of active questions. And these active questions get start with, did I do my best to? So the six I talk about in the book that have had terrific results are, did I do my best to, number one, set clear goals? Number two, make progress toward achieving my goals. Number three, find meaning. Number four, be happy. Number five, build positive relationships. And number six, be fully engaged. Every day, did I do my best to do these six very simple things? Well, what these questions do is they get us to take responsibility because all employee engagement in the past has revolved around passive questions. Well, when we ask people passive questions, like, do you have clear goals? And they say, no, they blame the environment. When we ask ourselves active questions every day, back to your comment, they cause us to stretch and take responsibility. The hardest question you can deal with every day has four qualities. Number one, you write the question. Now, why is that hard? You cannot blame the idiot that wrote the question. Mm -hmm. Number two, you know the answer. Why is that hard? You can't pretend you don't know how to do it. Number three, you know it's important. You can't pretend it's trivial. And number four, all you have to do to get a high score is try. You don't even have to succeed. All you have to do is try. Why is this so difficult every day? Nobody to blame. Mm, I if love I, it. If I wrote the question and I know the answer and I know it's important and I didn't even try, uh, who's responsible? That would be me. That's one you can't pass off to somebody else. And by the way, the reason this process is so hard, it is so much easier to be a victim and blame our problems on everybody else than it is to look in the mirror and say, what can I do to make things better? 
I love that. And, and those are the qualities. Got it. So the one question I wanted to ask, too, is and where does this fit in is the question, who do I want to be? Where does that fit in this? Well, to me, that's the basis of this. You see, my job is not to tell people what they want to be. It's to help people become the person that they do want to be. So my whole mission in life is not to tell people who they want to be. In the book, uh, I've got a model I think is very helpful called the Wheel of Change. Mm -hmm. In the Wheel of Change, we have two dimensions, negative to positive, and then we have change and keep. The first quadrant is called positive change. That's called creating. And the first way to look at our future is who's that new me I want to become? What is the positive change I want to create in my life? The second dimension is equally important. That's called positive keep. What do I want to preserve? Because we don't want to get so busy chasing what we don't have, we forget what we do have. And sure. What do I want to preserve in life? The third quadrant is a, a negative change. What do I need to eliminate or get rid of? Because if all we do is try to preserve and create and never eliminate, we just become chronically overcommitted. Then the final one is one we don't think about. Negative keep. What is it I just need to accept and make peace with? I may not love it. You know what? I'm not going to change it anyway. What do I need to just make peace with? Well, that's a great model to look at for creating. Who's the person I want to be for planning for planning that in your own life? I love that. Can you just give the audience an example of a negative keep? Oh, of course. Um, um, your mother-in-law. <laughs> you have, to, know, your you have, to, you right. have to keep her? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Your mother-in-law is not going anyplace. True. You're not going to change your mother-in-law. And True. so you need to accept that negative keep is accepting. It's things we need to accept in life. We may not love traffic. You're stuck in traffic. Okay, you can get angry and upset and bothered. You're not going to change the traffic. The weather, the coach of the sport team. You know, in life, we so much of our lives are wasted on things that we're not going to change anyway. Let me give you a personal example. I have a, my main home is called Rancho Santa Fe, California. My second home is in New York City. I have a condominium with the other young, hip, beautiful, and trendy people in Hell's Kitchen. One of my neighbors in New York City was a young woman named Lindsay Lohan. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of Lindsay Lohan before? Sure have. How many millions of hours around the world have been wasted with people reading about Lindsay Lohan got drunk and stoned and had a car wreck and went to jail? Millions of hours spent on Lindsay Lohan. Well, I always teach people this. You think Lindsay Lohan is a loser? She's not wasting her life reading about you. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you look at this concept of accepting, there's a great question I put in the book. It's one of my favorite chapters. Am I willing at this time to make the investment required to make a positive difference on this topic? If the answer is yes, go for it. If the answer is no, take a deep breath and let it go. Peter Drucker taught me our mission in life is to make a positive difference, not to prove how smart we are and not to prove how right we are. We get so lost proving how smart we are and right we are, we forget that's not what we're here on earth for. We're here to make a positive difference. If I'm not making a positive difference, who cares how smart I am and who cares how right I am? Well, you know, always think, am I willing at this time to make a positive difference on this topic? And if you are, go for it. Do it. If you're not, let it go. Put your time and energy where you can make a positive difference. Don't waste it carping about things you're going to change anyway. Absolutely. Could you read that question one more time? Am I willing to do? Am I willing at this time to make the investment required to make a positive difference on this topic? Love it. That is fantastic. So every day, Kate calls you and yes. asks you these six questions. So she asked more than that. She asked me a bunch of questions. The six questions are the first six. Gotcha. By the way, one of the questions is about that, am I willing at this time? And that is, um, you know, how did I do in terms of only dealing with topics where I can make a positive difference? Mm -hmm. That's one of my daily questions. I love that. that. That is absolutely brilliant. And this is why I love this book so much. Um is there anything you'd like to say to our audience before we leave? Yeah, my final best coaching advice. Take a deep breath. Imagine you're 95 years old and you're on your deathbed. You're just getting ready to die. Right before you take the last breath, you're given a beautiful gift. The ability to go back in time and 
talk to the person that's listening to me right now. The ability to help this person be a better leader, much more important, the ability to help this person have a better life. What advice would that wise 95-year-old you who knows what mattered in life and what did not matter and what was important and what was not important, what advice would that wise old person have for the you that's listening to me right now? Just don't just say anything or do anything. Just answer that question in your mind. Well, whatever you're thinking now, do that. In terms of performance appraisal, that's the only one that's going to matter. Some friends of mine interviewed old folks who are dying and said, what advice would you have? On the personal side, three themes. Theme number one, three words. Be happy now. Not next week, not next month, not next year. Great Western disease, I'll be happy when I get the money status. BMW condominium, I will be happy when. We all have the same when. Learning point from old people. I got so busy chasing what I didn't have, I never saw what I did have, and I had about everything. Hmm. Learning point number two, friends and family. I'm sure many of your listeners work for wonderful companies. When you're 95 years old and you look around your deathbed, none of your coworkers are waving goodbye. You realize these friends and family are kind of important. And number three, if you have a dream, go for it. Because if you don't go for it when you're 35, you may not when you're 45, and you probably won't when you're 85. It doesn't have to be a big one, maybe a small one. Go to New Zealand, speak Spanish, play guitar. Other people think your dream is goofy. Who cares? It's not their dream, it's yours. Business advice isn't much different. Number one, life is short, have fun. Number two, do whatever you can do to help people. The main reason to help people has nothing to do with money or status or getting ahead. The main reason to help people is much deeper. 95-year-old you is going to be proud of you because you did and disappointed if you don't. If you don't think that's true, interview any CEO who has retired, and I've interviewed very many, and ask them a question. What are you proud of? So far, none have told me how big their office was. All they've ever talked about is the people they helped. Mm. Final advice also the same. Go for it. Life is changing. Your industry is changing. Your world's changing. Do what you think is right. Might not win. At least you tried. Old people, we almost never regret the risk we take and fail. We always regret the risk we fail to take. So finally, Michael, thank you so much for asking me to talk to you. I really greatly appreciate you taking the time. Can you tell people where they can find you, Dr. Goldsmith? Sure. My email address, Marshall. Oh, one other thing, Michael. Yes. Owen, I forgot. One other. I, I, I went to a program and they said, who are your heroes? I wrote my heroes down. They okay. said, why are your heroes? Well, they were all teachers. They taught me stuff and they were very generous. I'm going to adopt 15 people who are coaches, teachers, professionals of some sort. I'm going to teach them everything I know for free. They're going to get to spend some days in training at no charge. I'm available to help them by phone, all free. The only cost is when they get old, they have to do the same thing. If any of your listeners are interested, please send me an email, marshall at marshallgoldsmith.com. I would be happy. Just write down 15 coaches. Be happy, happy to sign them up for my uh my free coaching process. It's kind of a legacy idea for me. And and I've already had a thousand applicants, so it's very exciting. That's really exciting. Thank you very much. That is very generous of you. I really appreciate that. Thank you. So everybody, this is Dr. Mike Akinfor with Dr. Marshall Goldsmith. And I want to thank you so much. All this information will be in the show notes. And I hope you have a great day. Ciao.